Next on The Broadway Show, she's Broadway's original dream girl, Tony winner Jennifer Holliday. She's on the show to talk about her return to the New York City stage and so much more. Plus, the disarming charm of a Broadway newcomer. You'll meet one of the brand new stars of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, Joel Myers. And picture perfect, we'll talk to the playwright behind Broadway's star-studded new smash hit, Pictures from Home. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. Broadway's biggest shows, Broadway's hottest tickets, they're all right here, along with Broadway's brightest stars. I'm Tamsin Fidel, this is The Broadway Show. Let's get going. February is Black History Month, and this week and all month long, we'll be highlighting black performers, organizations, and more. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, take care, T-C-V. Let's kick off this episode with Broadway's original dream girl, Tony and Grammy Award winner Jennifer Holliday. She's coming back to the New York City stage, playing 54 Below later this month. We had a chance to chat. So so let's talk about it. I mean, you have uh, an exciting show at 54 Below, so tell me about it. Turn the beat around, right? This is going to be part of the Diamond series. And so it's kind of that old, classic Hollywood kind of thing, you know? I'm going to be singing kind of a mixed group of songs because I wanted it to be very personal. You know, it's a small, intimate space and um, just wanted people to get an opportunity to get to know me a little bit through the song. So, um, so I'm gonna have some standards, but I'm also gonna have some soul music. Of course, I'm gonna have Broadway and my signatures of uh, stuff from Dreamgirls as well. So just gonna try to make it well-rounded and give a little bit of insight into me personally. little bit about that because I feel like as you know we came out of the pandemic I feel like we're all a bit more raw in terms of uh, who we are and what we're willing to share that maybe we weren't willing to share before right you hit it on the head that's exactly how I feel I have plenty of time to do a show that's with just straight songs of old songs you've already heard before somebody else sing I'd like to have some personal attachment to it these young people have brought me into, you know, this new time and 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 really uh, have uh, revived my, my career in a great sense. I think because we want truth and authenticity and it registers with us differently. And the, these young people, they're seeing now, my parents wouldn't have never even told us. They wouldn't have told us they're having sure. financial problems. They wouldn't have told us they're fighting, you know, all of those kind of things. But these young people have seen so much I get excited to see see it not just be all about the youth and all about 20 and 30 year olds. I'm, I'm a 52 year old woman and I, I didn't know I was still gonna be on camera at 52 years old in all honesty. And and to see this um, you know resurgence of all different ages and the fact that we're kind of just getting started at these ages now is, is pretty exciting to me. It is so exciting. And I, I really agree with you because I think because we were experiencing this before going into the pandemic, that we were kind of saying to ourselves, I need to accept myself as I am and meet myself at whatever age that I am. You know, so it's kind of like Mary J. Blige says, she gets up every morning and says, good morning, gorgeous. You have to really speak to yourself and know where it is that um, you want to to be, and I feel that even for myself at 62, I'm keep going, okay, I'm thinking about, you know, Lena Horne, I'm thinking about all of these women who are in their late, it's Cicely Tyson, all of them, fashion statements, all the way up until the end. And I'm going, I, I, I wanna kick my own self into gear like that as well. The Grammy Awards were last weekend. This year, all six nominees for Best Musical Theater Album were Broadway shows. And this year, the Grammy Award went to Into the Woods. Featuring the who's who of top Broadway talent and massive stars, including singer-songwriter, hit maker, Sarah Bareilles. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. Face the facts, find the boy, join the group, stop the giant, just get out of the woods. Winning in the Musical Theater Album category, I know that's, a, that's this is sort of special for you, right? 
Completely. It's it's like the ultimate team sport. I was thinking when we were recording this album, there's I I don't know of another time I was in a situation like that, live recording with a full orchestra. It was just exhilarating. What I've loved about the last six months, especially, is how many people are discovering moments in the woods. I, I've, I've heard so many younger theater fans who are, it's now like their favorite song. Is it exciting to become a part of sort of the legacy of the show in that way and to help expose people to it? Oh my God, yes. It's a tremendous honor. I, I don't think I ever in my wildest dreams would have imagined like this path for myself. And I love that people are, are, are revisiting it. I mean, that's what's so beautiful about theater, right? Like it, it gets to have these these other lives, these spokes on the wheel that, that live forever. It's beautiful. There are some brand new boy wizards at Hogwarts. Broadway newcomer Joel Myers is a new Albus Potter. That's why he's this week's fresh face. I'm Joel Myers. I play Albus Potter in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child on Broadway. So my earliest memory of Harry Potter was whenever the first movie came out, I was probably three or four. I hadn't been to many movies before and I got really concerned about the troll in the bathroom because I didn't really understand at the time like how movies worked. So my mom and I ended up having to leave halfway through that movie. <laughs> I have since rekindled my love for Harry Potter many times over. It really is, I think, the when I talk to people my age, it's kind of the defining franchise of our generation, and everyone loves Harry Potter. I didn't start acting acting until I was a little older. I went to the theater a lot with my grandma. I sort of jokingly, half-jokingly tell people that my acting career started in my great-grandmother's nursing home apartment. My grandma and I would go to the theater, we'd come home, and I'd like, dictate a script to her. We'd take it to see my great-grandmother and we'd do it for her and the staff there. You know, long before I ever thought about being an actor, but I just love the magic of the theater so much. I grew up with it in my life. It's always been a constant for me. Seattle Children's Theater has a great summer stage program for kids. You know, you sign up, you do four weeks of rehearsal, and you get to do the show. And that turned into, just in high school, something that I did every year. And by the time I got to the end of high school, I remember having a conversation with my advisor, who was also the theater director there. And I think he was teaching me how to like fold a blanket for some show, we were, maybe Susical we were doing. And I was, you know, not folding it right. And he's like, no, you have to be very careful. And I was sort of like, nah, no. And he's like, well, but you're going to be an actor, right? Like, you have to learn how to do this if you're going to be an actor. And that was the first time anyone had really ever said to me, like, oh, am I, am I going to do that? I don't know. Maybe I will. So I majored in astrophysics and theater in college. I knew I wanted theater and acting to be certainly a part of my experience, but I also wanted to have something else. People will sort of ask me, you know, those are two so different things. Like how does, where does those fit together? And for me, it was always actually, the more I did them back to back and side by side, I started seeing the crossovers and you know, you, you get into a, physics lecture and you have a problem and you lay out the pieces you have and you have the equations and how do you fit it all together. In the same way, it's kind of the same problem. You have all the pieces, the script, the actors, the tech. How do you put it all together to sort of arrive at, you know, something that you can share? And so I enjoyed looking for the crossover versus the difference is sort of where I arrived. So the first Broadway show I ever saw was Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark in this theater. As much as I was a Harry Potter fan, I was even more of a Spider-Man fan growing up. That was probably the first Broadway show that I was really aware of. When I came to audition for schools out here, I got to see Dear Evan Hansen like right before it blew up and I was in the front row watching Ben Platt do his thing. I was and still am very much a Dear Evan Hansen kid. <laughs> I mean, it's been the wildest ride that you can imagine. What has been the most rewarding thing about it has been just the outpouring of love from people who are such big fans of the show and have been from day one. You know, there's fans who have seen this show more times than I've performed in it now, which is crazy. When I was 15, I was that kid in the audience of Spider-Man looking at Reeve Carney going, oh my God, you're the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and you know, I hope that we can bring the magic like that for, you know, all the kids in the audience. And so to be playing Albus here right now is the dream come true. The Broadway show is back in just a sec.
What's up? I'm Brandon McCall, and I play Simba in Disney's The Lion King on Broadway, and you're watching The Broadway Show. Welcome back to The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get back to it. Broadway's biggest thriller just celebrated its one-year anniversary on Broadway with a great big cake. Based on the life and lyrics of the King of Pop, MJ the Musical is a winner of four Tony Awards and continues to break box office records at the Neil Simon Theater. Let's flash back to my conversation with now Tony Award winner, Miles Frost. Let's talk about you and where, where you started in all this and where you were before you ended up on Broadway in this starring role. When I got there, I was, I was still in college. I was in my senior year of college. I was at Bowie State University. And, uh, but before this, you know, I, was, I didn't really have any plans or intentions in going into Broadway. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an artist by trade. You know, I write, I sing, I play piano, drums. It's a few talents. A few, you know, a few <laughs> talents. Um, but that's where my that's where the core of my of my passion lies, and um, when I got this opportunity, I was like, who who would pass this up? You know, I'd done some talent shows in high school, singing and dancing to Michael Jackson. I won those talent shows, and I was like, you know, I like being on stage, I like dancing, and I. I'm gonna I have to look at all your talent show reels. I know, I know. <laughs> when I was 16, it was my junior year, and I said, yeah, I'm gonna do Billie Jean this year, and. Uh, I did it. My mom's in the back holding her iPad up <laughs> with the flash on. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I came out on the hoverboard because that's when oh, hoverboards was, yeah. That's great. I was like, how can I be out of the box? Right. Yeah, I was trying to find ways to just be super creative. Came out on the hoverboard, went into the position that did Billie Jean. My mom posted on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that was 2016. 2021 is when I got the call. And I got a call saying, hey, uh, we found this video of you doing Billie Jean. I see that it's dated um, 2016. Can you like? Do you, can you still do that, but like sing better and, and dance better? I was like, yeah. When I got off the phone, I was like, I hadn't done that since then. I was like, I was lying. I was like, uh, <laughs> I hope. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Picture this, it's the brand new star-studded Broadway production, Pictures from Home, and it's all about bringing photographs to life. Here's Beth Stevens with a new edition of Building Broadway. Thanks, Samson. We're here in upstate New York where Char White lives and writes. Let's take a look. Char, thank you for welcoming us to your home as we talk about pictures from home. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming all the way up to Cold Spring. We're going to talk about the play, but first I want to talk about you becoming a playwright. Um, Oof, yeah. Because you're it's... a little bit of a slow burn. <laughs> slow burn. It took decades. So, yeah, really slow burn. You know, I just buckled down for the long haul. I didn't have any prospects. I didn't know anybody. I didn't go to school. I wasn't connected in the industry. And I finally, I had like, I, I won a small award and I thought a prize and I thought like, maybe this, maybe I can get an agent. And then the, the big breakthrough for me was the other place, which MCC with Lori did with Laurie Metcalf and Joe Mantello directing. And, and that was in 2011. But at the time, I mean, I still had my nine to five job in advertising. So I would, I would leave work. I would run to rehearsals in the afternoon. I would go back to work. I'd go back to work. You know, it was, I'd go back to rehearsals on the weekend and it was, I was, I was, you know, really hustling. Well, one of the reasons why I asked you about your slow burn <laughs> of your, of the start of your career <laughs> is the tenacity that you had and how that relates to Pictures From Home and Larry Sultan spending almost mm, 10 years yeah. deeply investigating his yeah, family. That's interesting. Maybe that's what really appealed to me. He didn't even know it was Pictures From Home at the time. He first got the idea to photograph and interview his parents in 1982. And the book, Pictures From Home, and the book itself is the project. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just the photographs. It's the interviews of his parents. It's his meditations on childhood. It's their story of the taking part of this like great post-war migration westward and yeah that project was 10 years and 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 in the end that it's the search for the project that makes the project so um poignant i think so let's talk about yeah. your introduction to this work i was in los angeles i was shooting a season of the affair and a friend of mine said you have to come to lacma la county museum of art with me to see this exhibit 
And there was this section of the museum that was devoted to pictures from home, and there was this text on the wall, this, this dialogue that was between he and his father, and it was this argument about image and ownership of image, and, and that made it in the play as well, which is, which is his father says, you know, it's, you know, it's your picture, but it's my image. So whose truth is it? I was fascinated. I was fascinated by the, the dynamic, by how Larry's father, Irv, could be so rejecting of what Larry did on some profound level, but then also incredibly engaged in the process. And, and both um, Irv and Larry's mother, Jean, letting him into their home for 10 years to just photograph and photograph and photograph. Like that in and to itself, the, the, the intimacy of that and the love of that act and also how much it must have driven them crazy, I knew had to form the core of the play. One of the wonderful things about the play, it's incredibly intimate. And the other thing that's very intimate is a writer working because it's solo activity. Yeah, yeah, so that's true. Are you ready to welcome us into your writing lair? <laughs> sure, sure, if you dare. It's teeny. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely, come on. This is so amazing. Yeah. This, this really is the dream for a writer. Yeah. This is where you do all your this work. This is where I do all my work. This desk, my hair cutter moonlights as a brilliant carpenter. And he built this desk out of um, an ash tree that we had to take down. This chair, when I was really down and out and I was living in Hell's Kitchen, I was on the ground floor of 48th and 10th. And um, this old guy had died across the street and they were just hauling his stuff out, including this chair. I took it and ref refurbished it. And so that's been my chair forever. And and I'm spying your journal. So, I mean, I'll, I'll keep a journal on all of my projects, even when they don't go anywhere. I mean, a lot, some of them, I'll, like I'll get five pages and I'm like, rah, rah, like that one's gone. But I've got like my, I've got my other place journal. This is even really before I started the process. You know, what are my next scenes? I'll write that, I'll write that down too. Like this is, this is, this is pictures wrong. Well, you get to write and then this is your view. That's just gorgeous. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I'll write and then I'll print up, I'll print pages and I'll sit here and I'll, I'll edit and take a little nap. <laughs> it's not like when you were salvaging this chair in Hell's Kitchen, I'll tell you. It is not. There was a very, that chair was in a very different scenario in Hell's Kitchen, without a doubt. You like what you just saw? Well, there's an exclusive extended web version of this interview over at broadway.com. We'll be right back. Thanks so much for staying with us for this latest edition of the Broadway show. So glad you're here. Chicago is Broadway's longest running American musical. But this past week, the standing ovation was for the audience. Two-time Tony Award winner B.B. Newworth helped celebrate Teacher's Night on Broadway. 500 New York City public educators were honored at the show February 2nd. Teacher's Night's a partnership between the Broadway League and the United Federation of Teachers. I got the eye of the tiger, fire, dancing through the fire. Okay, now let's talk about Anne Juliet because there is definitely life after Romeo. Juliet's living her best life in the new pop concert spectacular. I get to interact with the audience a little bit. I get to see a little bit of the, like the Debbie Doubters out there who are like, ugh, pop hits, jukebox musical. You know, what? It, what is this? By the end, they are up on, on their, their feet, feet and they are telling everyone outside the theater that they have to go see it and I see them back. And I think that that is like, that is the magic of this show, is it totally catches you by surprise and transports you. It is the most joyous show. It's kind of trippy because this is a story and not just a concert. You have to place these songs, which we know really well, into the context of the show. And then you're living that moment in the show. So the song takes on a totally new meaning than it did when you knew it when you were younger. It's very similar to the way Max wrote these songs. He wrote them for different pop stars. And if you kind of look at these pop stars, like we're all different pop stars in our own story. And it's like you have this pop anthem playing in your head that you're using to express right. the story. Since you be gone, I can for the, first time. the beauty is that my character, Juliet, becomes her own. She finds her voice and she ends up becoming a, like a pop star, essentially, at the end. So. 
I mean, we're we're influenced as as actors and as singers. We're we're influenced by other artists all the time, and that's how we find our own voice. I love that that there is Kelly Clarkson's version, and there's my version. Of course, she she influenced my version, of course. But I also get to to add in my experiences, my past, my past, and like singing gospel music since I was 12, and bringing that to to, to my character, which is amazing. That's going to do it for us, but until next time, check out The Broadway Show on Cut wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.